Hey guys, welcome to the Better Beach YouTube channel. My name is Brandon. We're going to be giving you guys a two-part series on volleyball positioning. In this first part, we're going to be focusing on where you should be standing on the court and a little bit of background into what player should be playing each position. I know in beach volleyball, there are only two people, but we're gonna dive a little bit deeper and give you guys a good understanding of what position you should be playing based on your strengths and or your weaknesses. Before we get going, it would mean a lot to us if you subscribe for this channel if you're not already subscribed and also give us a like and if you want to get notified about more videos that we're making in the future hit that little bell so you can get notified when we make new content recently we've been getting a lot of questions from players asking what side of the court they should be playing in beach volleyball we have two different sides we have a left side and we have a right side if you have your choice if you are a right-handed player you should be playing on the left side of the court. And the reason for that is because when you pass the ball and you shuffle, when you are receiving your set, 90% of the balls that you hit are going to land on your inside shoulder, which means that's your power option. Vice versa, if you happen to be a left-handed player, then you should be playing on the right side of the court. Because if I pass this ball and I shuffle out, 90% of the balls that I get set are gonna be left inside, which is opening me up for my power swing with my left hand. Unfortunately, some of us don't have the ability to choose who we play with. So some basic information that can help you guys decide who should be playing which side. This is assuming that both players are right-handed. Normally, the left side player is going to be the stronger attacker. A great example of this is Phil Dauhauser. If he has to help Nick out, he can go over on two. So it's almost like they have two options of attacking. Vice versa, if you happen to have two left-handed players, then your stronger attacker should be on the right side so that they can once again help out that passer and go over on two as well. If you both happen to be around the same skill level and you can't say who's a better hitter or who's a better passer, then you need to put whoever has the better feet on their weak side. So what I mean by that is if me and my partner are both right-handed and he is not very quick with his feet, but I'm really, really fast and I can adjust to sets really well, then I'm gonna put myself on my weak side because that's the trouble that we're gonna run into. So now that we've decided who's gonna be playing which side based on our strengths or our weaknesses, now we can talk about where we should actually be standing. The most common problem that we get when we are coaching someone is that somebody is standing in a position where they have to go backwards and forwards. This is a tricky situation to be in because now you're having to judge the serve every single time. For a basic setup rule, you should divide the court in half before you get going. So my partner would have his side of the court and I would have my side of the court. Once I've found my half, I need to stand in the middle of my half. A basic positioning is once you've found the middle of your half of the court, you should be about four to six feet away from the end line. The reason for this is if a, somebody serves a ball right at my head and I'm standing this deep, then I know that it's out of bounds. So unless the ball is very loopy, I'm not gonna have to worry too much about passing a ball behind me. Obviously, it's still gonna happen. You still need to get your feet there. But by putting yourself in this position, being in the middle of your half of the court and being about four to six feet away from your end line, you are now worrying about all the serves that are going to come at you and anything in front of you, which is going to allow you to move in one direction. The same thing would go on the right side of the court. Your partner should be splitting their half and also have the distance from the end line that you have. The only time that this will change if there is wind and based on serving location. If you're interested in figuring out what you need to do with different serving locations, make sure you check out our serving videos and service -y videos. Surprise! Sorry for interrupting your beautiful viewing experience, but I just wanted to take a minute to tell you about Volley Chat. Volley Chat, Get Better at Beach Volleyball is our Facebook group where we talk about everything beach volleyball. So any deep burning beach volleyball questions, gossip, and ways to get better, what drills to do, and advice from high-level professionals, high-level coaches, and FIVB refs. We're talking about all of that on Volley Chat. 
Get Better at Beach Volleyball. You can find it by typing in www.facebook.com forward slash groups forward slash better at beach. We hope to see you there, join the conversation, and you'll be talking directly with me and everybody at Better at Beach. We've already talked about where we're going to be in serve receive, so now we need to talk about where we're gonna be starting on defense. On defense, we have two different positions. We have a blocker and we have a defender. The blocker is obviously gonna be the person at the net who's trying to block the attacker from getting the ball onto their side. Normally, we see blockers as being big individuals with a lot of height or they have the ability to jump. So really good examples on the women's side is we have people like Alex Kleinman or on the men's side, we have Phil Dahlhauser or we have people who have a really, really high jump, kind of like Troy Field, who I think is only like 6'2", but he plays just as big as Phil. So if you're either a really good jumper or you're blessed with being very, very tall, then you are probably going to find a really good home at the net being a blocker. One thing that I suggest that we don't see a whole lot, especially in beginner groups, is whenever the blocker is at the net, it's a good idea to start in the middle of the court. And the reason for that is once the serve happens, you can quickly adjust to which attacker you're going to be blocking. But if we start in the middle of the court, then it allows us to adjust and we don't have to chase too far. If you start in front of one attacker or the other, then you're going to have to move really far distance if your server doesn't serve the person you're hoping for. So whenever we're talking about block positioning, one thing that I think is very important is the distance from the net. Okay, A lot of us start really, really tight to the net and when we jump, we jump backwards which isn't a good idea for blocking because now that ball is probably going to land on your side. So we want to take a step away from the net. And what I normally do is I get my arms at a 90 degree angle and that's about the distance that I want to stay from the net. So I'm really close to the net with my fingertips and depending on where that set goes, I can make my adjustment and then when I jump, I can push my hands over the net when I'm ready to block. As far as other positioning goes, if you're looking to be the most effective blocker possible, then you need to make sure that you are in the runway of that attacker. So when anyone is coming to attack the ball and hopefully hit it into your block, you should feel like if they keep running straight, they are going to run directly into your body. Now that we've talked about our basic setup of our blocking and we figured out how to get in front of our attacker, now it's important to try to figure out how to win what we call the cat and mouse battle. Blocker's movement has a lot of effect on the attacker's decision making. So when you're up at the net, don't just think about, oh, I showed my defender I'm blocking line, so I'm gonna get in this line and I'm gonna take everything away. It's your job to almost want to make that attacker either hit that line or go away from you, while also still being a little disciplined and making sure that you're taking away what you said. This can happen a couple different ways. You can either make sure that your movements are really late and defined so that you are jumping up and meeting that attacker when they're hitting, or you can throw in what we like to call fake peels. Fake peels are gonna almost make it seem like there's no blocker up at the net, but then, you are going to have your hands up there and you're going to finish that block. When we're talking about blocking, one thing that we have to focus on and we have to think about is peeling off of the net. For most levels of play, whether we're talking about beginners or pros, peeling is going to happen quite a bit throughout a match. If as a blocker, you don't feel threatened by that attacker, then you need to get off of the net and help your defender play defense and cover the court. We have a lot of videos on blocking technique, on peeling technique as well, but as a quick overview, one thing that we're always going to do is we wanna to try to create as much space away from the net as we can, but also get stopped and be faced towards the net. So whenever you're peeling, we like to say that you should feel like you're in almost like a T-Rex position. All right, we've all acted like we're a T-Rex at one point in our life. Okay, so when we're playing, when we're blocking, our hands are kind of strict. We're in this 90 degree angle. And once I decide that I'm gonna pull off the net, I'm gonna go into a little T-Rex position and I'm going to start this crossover move. So once my hands are relaxed, that's gonna help me react and actually get a touch on a, on a hit. But 
I'm going to step off the net, creating some space from the net, give me one crossover step, and then a plant plant. And now my hands are relaxed and I'm ready to make any dig that I would need to make from that attacker that's no longer on the net. As a good frame of reference, your attacker, if they are not threatening, they should not be able to hit in the front half of the court. So when you're pulling off the net, as long as you get to about halfway, then you should be able to touch most of the attacks that they're going to be making. And if they happen to make one over you, that's just a really, really good shot. When we're talking about pulling and we're talking about blocking, uh, there's certainly a level of play and a, the amount of times that you should be peeling related to that level of play. Obviously, it's all dependent on the, the attacker on the other side and your ability to block. But I think it's pretty safe to say that if you're in the beginner and intermediate level, then you're probably going to be peeling maybe 50, 60, 70% of the time, unless you're playing against an attacker that's really, really strong and they can hit straight down. As you go up in level to intermediate, advanced, open, pro, then you're going to see that peel frequency kind of tone down a little bit. But it's something that you really need to consider and you need to make sure that you're putting yourself into a position where you can block balls that you feel threatened by and you can pull on balls that you don't feel that threatened feeling. The last position that we have is a defender. If you're a defender, if you're a smaller individual who is known for their speed and their control, then you're going to find yourself away from the net. And hopefully you can find someone to throw up there to get big and block balls just like Phil or Alex. And you can just sit in the back and dig hard driven balls or chase down shots. If you feel like you are a very, very quick individual, your reaction time is very, very fast, and you're not scared to get hit with a ball, then being a defender is your calling. Two defenders that come to mind that you can learn a ton from, from the men's side, Taylor Crabb, and from the women's side, Sarah Sponsel. Both of those players fit the mold of what I just explained about being bold players, not being scared of anything, and also being two of the quickest people I've ever watched play the sport. When we're talking about defensive positioning, we need to think about that you don't have a side of the court. As a defender, your job is to put yourself in a position where you can touch as many balls as possible. So one thing that we like to say is whenever you serve that ball over the net and you have picked up on what your blocker says they're taking away, then you should set yourself up in the middle of the court, middle of the court of the sidelines and middle of the court as far as net to the end line. The reason for that is because now you have put yourself in a good position to pick up a lot of different shots. Once you have put yourself there, then, depending on what your blocker has called, you can make a late switch into a different position, which is going to be opposite of what your blocker called. So if my blocker says they're taking line, I'm going to put myself opposite of them, and I'm going to try to put my body in a position so that I can see that attacker at all times. If I stand behind that blocker, then I'm leaving a lot of open court and that's not gonna help anybody. Something that we see that can mess with defenders a little bit is we get too ingrained in just sticking to our spot. So going a little bit deeper into the next video, we're going to be talking about different positions that the defender can put themselves in, how they can react out of it and put themselves into the best position to score. So if you're interested in defensive plays, make sure you turn in to part two. If you don't have somebody who is really, really tall or really, really good jumper that's going to be your full-time blocker, then what you're most commonly going to see, and this is everywhere in the world, is you're going to see people split blocking, which means whoever is not serving is going to be the person at the net. This is a really good idea for people who are just starting out or people who are the same skill level as their partner because you're going to be able to conserve energy. Running from the service line all the way up to the net can get very, very tiring, especially in a tournament. So if you're interested in doing split blocking, then all that means is whoever is not serving is going to be at the net. We're starting to see this a lot more, not only in lower level tournaments, but even on the Pro Tour. We're starting to see Triborn and Trevor Crabb who have decided to start split blocking and are 
close to representing the U.S. in the Olympics. The last thing, and this is one of the most commonly asked questions at our practices, is what if I'm not tall enough to block? And sometimes you run into a situation where neither you or your partner can jump high enough to get your hands over the net. The last thing that you should be doing is just staying back and playing defense. Attackers love hitting lines, and that's pretty much what you are giving them. So, if neither of you are tall enough to be blockers, then you're going to become what we call a net protector. You're going to look like you're going to be blocking. You're going to be running up to the net every single time the ball's on the other side of the net. You're looking to see if that set is going to be coming over the net or not. And once you realize that it's not coming over the net, then that's when you would pull back and play defense. The main reason that we do this is because especially at lower levels, way too many points are given up because of oversets. And that only happens when we have two defenders just camped out back in the court, not even worrying about where that set location goes. So if both of you are not tall enough to send somebody to the net, then one of you has to get up there still to protect the net from oversets. And once you see that it's not an overset, then you can get back and play defense. All right, guys. Well, I hope you enjoyed that video. Uh, make sure you keep an eye out for part two, which will be coming out soon. And also, if you are looking to get better at beach volleyball, please head over to our website, betteratbeach.com. We have courses on every single skill. We have tutorials on how to better your arm swing. We have a continued learning library that can help you get better every two weeks. And we also have memberships available if you're really, really looking to grind. So we'll see you soon.